Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to the New Books Network. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Blethyn Bowen. He's a professor at the University of Leicester, an expert in astropolitics and space warfare, and author of the book, Original Sin, Power, Technology, and War in Outer Space. And in the interest of full disclosure, Blethyn is also one of my PhD supervisors, but certainly that will not affect the nature of the questions for this work and this book. Blethyn, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Thank you so much for having me on, Sam. And uh, I'll try to make sure this doesn't turn into a PhD supervision meeting. (laughs) Much obliged for that. So I want to start by asking you, how does one become involved in the field of astropolitics and space warfare? And when did you kind of start going down this intellectual rabbit hole? And what made you stick with it as an area of expertise? Uh, as, as with any academic specialism, it really is uh, up to you as, as an individual, really, and for people to get themselves into it and, to, and just, to, just to read things about it and hope that you stumble onto more good readings rather than bad readings about a subject. Because if, as a student, you read just lots of bad stuff about a subject, it can really put you off it for the rest of your life. So uh, um, so I can really talk about my experience um, you know, in any, any great detail. So... When I started as an undergraduate, really the formative text for me was uh, Michael Sheehan's 2007 book, The International Politics of Space. And it was really the most, um, it was the most uh, systematic analytical approach to politics in space with, you know, with a big picture focus that was out there at the time. So this was, uh, it was quite new at the time as well. So I started my undergraduate studies in 2007 and uh, that book came out at the same time. So when it came to my uh, dissertation in my final year of undergraduate studies, um, that was sort of one of the, the, the touchstones really for it. And at the time, a lot of books were, as as you would expect, uh, very US dominated, um, especially um, uh, you know in the in the English uh, English language. So um, it was quite refreshing to have a book uh, that deliberately looked at uh, other countries uh, doing things in space and made made space look like a much bigger subject than it was at the time. And uh, those who read Original Sin and have read Michael Sheehan's book will see that when I quote Michael Sheehan quite a bit, but I've also sort of um, sort of uh, been sort of inspired by sort of the global approach of that um, of that book by Michael Sheehan as well. And what really sparked that interest in space in the first place really was um, getting into strategic studies or war studies in my degree at Aberystwyth University in West Wales in international politics. And when you do war studies and modern warfare in particular, you can't really ignore the reality of how the United States military has used space systems, especially in wars since the 1991 Gulf War. So looking at modern warfare and the US ways of war and all that stuff, I got very interested in the use of modern space systems. So GPS in particular, um, that sort of made me then think, oh, I can match my interest in war and international politics with my sort of pre-existing interests, casual interests in things to do with outer space and space exploration. And sort of things went from there, really. So I did my bachelor's dissertation on uh, the international politics of space. And in my master's, I geared every other assignment I had freedom over onto something in space. So on the European security module, I did European security in space. And I found that everything was better once you put in space uh, at the end of it, really. And then I did a PhD on space, sadly not in space, um, but my PhD was on space power theory, uh, also at Aberystwyth University. Um, so, so yeah, so it was a matching of my interest in war studies and IR, and then just stumbling onto the space elements of that in modern warfare, and then getting into the niche literature um, as a student at the time. And I didn't really have anyone teach me anything about space policy or space warfare, everything I had to read myself, really. And I learned a lot in my PhD research when I was able to go to Washington, D.C., and I was a visiting scholar at the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University for a few months. And talking to actual space experts and doing interviews, um, that provided a lot of my sort of, well, my only space education outside of reading, uh, really. Uh, so, So that's sort of how I got into this.
and I imagine the field as a whole looks pretty different today, given the events of the past few years than it did when you first got involved. Uh, has it become a little more crowded? And if so, is that uh, crowding to the detriment of the topic or is it bringing more attention to some of the serious uh, academic side of this part? So absolutely, it's it's transformed from 10 years ago. And I started my PhD in 2012. So, you know, 11 years ago, 10, 10, over 10 years ago now. And back then, there were so few reputable um, sort of experts on space, especially outside the um, military and, and government uh, practitioner circuit. So very few independent academics that were just doing everyday space activities and space infrastructure approaches. So it was a very, very rare specialism uh, to find. And now with, I think in particular, Space Force in the last few years, it's mainstreamed military space activities to a degree that just hasn't been achieved before. I mean, maybe only with Reagan's SDI, uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars, possibly. But I wasn't, I wasn't around for that, so I can't say. But, um, but the mainstreaming of military space in particular and satellites as tools of warfare now, um, there's much more awareness of that today. And. You know, years and years ago, you know, I was engaging with a lot of European policy experts um, on space and um, European security experts so in, the, in the mid-2010s. And back then, they were still talking about whether there were real threats to space systems and things like that. Uh, of course, the Americans have been saying yes for a long time. These days, you know, that argument has been won. The argument now is what do, what do we do as a transatlantic security community about the existing and sort of near-term space threats? So, the, sh- the tone and debate has shifted. You know, NATO has, you know, a proper, uh, you know, space doctrine now as well. So in terms of um, establishing space as a serious topic for military and security uh, specialists has, has changed a lot. And people have stopped laughing at the specialism now. So I got funny looks and uh, raised eyebrows when I told people I was doing space politics and space warfare as a, as a PhD student. You know, that's no longer the case. And, you know, people in, especially in UK practitioner circles, have stopped laughing at me now. So I, I guess that's progress. Um, in terms of crowding out the field, no, I think there's so few people doing it we just need loads more serious academics doing it now because for too long space has been reserved for military and intelligence practitioners which are of course important and needed but if we are to be a normal aspect of um, the academy and a normal aspect of life and civil and government work then you need loads of independent experts on this and there's just not enough right now in the academy working on space politics. Well, this book, Original Sin, is certainly a step in that direction you describe. And I should note, it's your your second book kind of on this topic writ large. Uh, would you just briefly mention what the first one was and how this uh, represents, for you at least, uh, intellectual continuity into exploring the topic? Yeah, yeah. So the first book, War in Space, Strategy, Space Power, Geopolitics, is based on my PhD thesis. So it's quite a dry academic tome. And it's about space power theory. So that is discussing ideas and concepts about military strategy and military theory uh, to help us understand the big strategic picture about the use of space technology in warfare. And for anyone who's looked at space strategy or space theories, uh, you'll find that there's a lot of analogies between the sea and space. And some people use air power analogies to, to space as well. So what I did in that PhD and then the first book, War in Space, was basically to build on a lot of the naval analogies that have been done to understand power and strategy in space. But rather than use the oceanic blue water ideas um, as an end point, rather than see it as a starting point or a foundation for understanding operations and strategy in Earth orbit, as part of a coastal environment or, or a cosmic coastline. And I used a lot of continental sea power theory to draw out ideas to explain how space power, space warfare, operations in Earth orbit um, can be made most useful to conflicts and wars on Earth. And that has many strategic parallels to how people have argued and thought about and debated and tried to get funding for continental navies because they had to make 
you know, the sea relevant in continental wars. And when you have a land-based strategic culture, um, you know, the sea and the navies tend to take, you know, a second billing in that in that sort of bureaucratic and funding packing order. So in the same way that space is about supporting the primary theatres on Earth, you know, it's a secondary environment. It's up there. It's out of sight and out of mind for a lot of people. So there are lots of parallels there. And, you know, we are just doing stuff in Earth orbit that matter militarily and economically. Uh, beyond Earth orbit, nothing of significance really happens for military and economic purposes. So we're just really able to do things in the coastal zone of Earth orbit. We're not in deep space doing anything significant militarily or economically. So that in a nutshell is sort of what the book tries to say and the hand it goes into you know Clausewitzian theory and Mahan and Corbett, Castex, Gorshkov, Menon, um, and just a, sort of has tries to have a meaningful conceptual discussion of how to think better about power and space. Um, that's that book, though, is, as I said, is quite dry and um, is really for researchers and high level uh, sort of military strategists uh, who deal with a lot of sort of conceptual issues in strategy. The second books now, Original Sin, that is for a wider audience. And that book ends where my first book begins on the sort of the coastal analogy to military power and space. So in some ways, I guess my second book is is something of a prequel uh, to the first one. But um, the second book, Original Sin, um, so that is a, a really a big picture, global, international, political history and uh, international relations analysis of 70 years of the global space age, really. Um, and with everything that's gone on over the last 70 years, we've only just been able to make Earth orbit, you know, the, the cosmic shoreline, as people like Carl Sagan would say, um, useful and reliable for everyday military, political, economic uh, activities and operations. So, you know, we're only at the very start of what we can call a space age, even after 70 years, and that is a rich political uh, and politicized history as well and it's about much more than science and engineering which which is what popular histories focus on but people who do politics society history you know they belong in space as well and i hope that book makes a you know a, you know provides an introduction on space politics and history of the past 70 years to people who want to get into that Yes, and it certainly does touch on some of the uh, lesser known incidents that the public certainly wouldn't be aware of, which uh, we'll, we'll get to in a bit. But let me ask, so what is the original sin that your title refers to? Are we talking about more of a, a thematic element or is there a singular event or moment that kind of represents the, the genesis point of this trend that you're looking at? Oh, it's just a catchy title, you know. That's it. No, <laughs> no. Um, that's a good I one. mean, yeah, it's you know, it's 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 a metaphor, you know, uh, really, and um, it's sort of where where the argument for the book begins. So, the there is a perception, and you know, it's quite dominant in the in popular media, you know, and the received wisdom that we get about outer space, where, you know, it's a perception that space is a place for scientific pursuits, you know, the, the noble pursuit of knowledge and pushing back the envelope of the mysteries of the universe, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, people like Carl Sagan and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, uh, you know, uh, all those, um, you know, popular space science people, um, that sort of angle has sort of dominated public understanding and perceptions of space. And, that was accelerated really by the deliberate use of prestige projects by the superpowers in the Cold War, you know, for the, uh, you know, the people in space, people on the moon. And that has hidden really the militarized origins of these space technologies um, and their continuing military uses and the military interests in outer space uh, to this day. So, the original sin really refers to the heri uh, the the militarized heritage of our space age as a whole, um, and where all these space technologies that we use today come from. Now, it doesn't mean that we should stop having a space age. We should defund space. I'm not saying that at all. Um, if you like space exploration and you like looking at pictures from you know various telescopes, you know. That's absolutely fine, but there's a lot more to understanding space in its totality, uh, as and as part of the of human uh, the human experience. So 
we didn't go to space as collectively as a civilization uh, just because there were curious scientists. Money and massive resources were poured into experimental, temperamental weapons technologies, which opened up space for everyone else. And this is not just about the superpowers. Um, they led the way, of course. And of course, before the superpowers, uh, Nazi Germany led the way in uh, the V2 rocket advancements with Werner von Braun. But um, other countries are doing the same as well. And we're also pursuing these essential space technologies for military and ultimately strategic interests. So France and Britain have their own rocket and satellite programs, which are intimately tied to their nuclear and missile programs. Uh, China as well, uh, you know, back in the 1960s, and also, um, to a lesser extent, India and Japan. So India um, was maybe more civilian first, but military interests were only ever at arm's length away. And um, similar to its nuclear program, it was ostensibly civilian, but it helped India become a nuclear weapon state and was part of the rationales behind supporting these very expensive technologies. Japan itself was developing uh, its first uh, sounding rockets and orbital rockets at the same time. There were discussions amongst Japanese elites about whether it should actually develop its own nuclear weapons capability and whether it could actually rely on the United States to commit to uh, extended deterrence over Japan um, and and also wider industrial interests as well. So competitive, self-interested politics there. So so that's sort of the original sin and is to show that, you know, not every everything that's happened in space is for the benefit of all humankind not all space technologies have been developed to benefit everyone like all technologies space technologies have been built by certain people certain organizations for certain purposes and they have loads of different effects and they're not always noble reasons and then and they're often quite selfish reasons as well. So this is sort of a corrective to very optimistic and quite politically naive perceptions of space that are still sort of the received wisdom for many people. I think you answered my uh, next question very well, which was that uh, catchy title aside, you know, sin certainly implies a, a moral or ethical element of all this. So if I heard you correctly, that's really, as you said, the idea that... Um, the noble pursuits that so many associate with activities in outer space. Uh, there's definitely more behind the curtain and it bears looking into the military and intelligence element behind some of these space systems. Yes. Yeah. So um, the, you know, put masses of, of money that was poured in really was um, there to realize the, the goals of nuclear war fighting for the, you know, especially the superpowers at the start, um, but also for the deployment of satellite communications and spy satellites, again, for the mil military and, uh, and government purposes. So these things really established baseline rocket and satellite technologies, which just enabled everything else. And um, a lot of these things were hidden from public view. Um, and, it, and it's quite interesting because, you know, in practitioner circles, um, so in, in, you know, various diplomatic uh, services in various countries, it was an open secret that, yeah, the superpowers and some of the countries do have spy satellites in space, but it was something that was just never talked about uh, in, in large public forums really at the time. And um, uh, as I'm sure many of your listeners would know, you know, the National Reconnaissance Office, which was set up in 1961 to build and manage and operate um, America's first spy satellites, um, they were they were still uh, a classified agency until 1992. Um, so, you know, the acknowledgement of the NRO was a secret for the entirety of the Cold War. And, you know, many governments wanted this to happen because for many people, there was that reluctance uh, to want to do bad things in outer space because for many people, they have a, a religious reverence to outer space as of the heavens and whatnot. So putting ostensibly um, sinful human military things in space uh, may be hard or just hard, too hard a job to defend for many politicians. Um, so not a big deal was made of it. And, uh, you know, that's obviously changed these days um, in terms of the narrative, but the substance of it has stayed the same. And, you know, in many ways, the big powers today are picking up where the superpowers left off in the 1980s in terms of military space technologies and anti-satellite weapons. And 
as I read through your book, I, I took the opportunity to do a little bit of straw polling with some uh, people who I consider very well read. And I was surprised to the extent that some of this early history really has escaped, again, the attention of um, not just the public, but some who actually specialize in national security. And, and I'm thinking in particular of, uh, despite all the, the popular attention that, for example, the Apollo gets in the early 1960s, at the same time, we had actual nuclear testing and detonations in orbit, which again seems to have been lost to history in some respect among the general public that this was something that happened. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, 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 I guess I judge my academic colleagues a bit, uh, you know, uh, not a bit. Uh, I, I do judge them harshly, <laughs> um, <laughs> as, as we all do for people who aren't in our areas of specialism for not uh, uh, appreciating our areas of specialism. Um, I mean, uh, you know, in terms of public consciousness, you know, it's not surprising at all. And of course, if the public knew all of this, then us academics would be out of a job. So, um, but yeah, but for academic colleagues and also many practitioners, yeah, it's surprising that they they do have that sanitized image of outer space when there are, you know, there is a literature out there that talks about these things. Um, you know, I'm not the first person to talk about the military uses of outer space in a, in a mass market book. Um, but yeah, I'm not surprised to hear you say that. And the the knowledge of military space activities really has been basically a pet hobby for people within maybe the arms control community because uh, they'll know about the limited test ban treaty of 1963, which uh, forbade nuclear weapons testing um, in on on land, at sea, in the atmosphere, and outer space. And that was, um, you know, a direct response to the Starfish Prime test the United States conducted in the Pacific, which knocked out some power grids in Hawaii, I think, uh, and also knocked out one third of the um, orbiting satellites at the time in space. So um, that is quite a well-known vignette in arms control communities, but that's a very specialist, very elite community, you know. Um, but I, I think... Um, when you look at international relations, national security studies or war studies, um, and also a lot of Cold War history as fields and as specialisms, you'd really struggle to notice that we're in a space age. Um, there's, you know, there's been good Cold War history stuff about, you know, Apollo and public perceptions of it. And, but, but again, their sideshows, crude space flight is, you know, militarily and economically rather pointless. Um, Compare that to the missiles, the satellites, the rockets, and the ground stations, and the downstream applications of what you do with satellite data with peripherals and data services on the ground. That's what the space age is, not, you know, astronauts playing guitars on the space station, you know, or, th <laughs> or things like that, you know. And don't get me wrong, I'm not hostile to human spaceflight necessarily, but it's like, that's not what really matters in the space age as we know it and how it's been for the past 70 years. It's about today the thousands of machines in space that are gathering data, transmitting data, relaying data uh, for terrestrial purposes, you know, economic, military, political, social, uh, whatever whatever you want to call it. So, so it's astonishing really that very few people do get the space age as it is um and um and, and colleagues in science and technology studies are also one of the few other areas of specialism that have looked at this but any other area in the humanities social sciences and arts um there's there's so much that they need to be doing with space um you know and, and there's been a lot about space archaeology in the last few years as well so looking at um how space not only transforms archaeology on earth but looking at how um, we need to look at space junk as artifacts or looking at the remains of old ground stations and ground facilities and the artifacts they have and how they need to be preserved, etc. So um, so there's so much more that, uh, I guess, for Americans, you know, liberal arts can do for space. Um, and we just need more people to do solid research on it because it has been ignored by a lot of disciplines in the academy that ought to know better. So I, I don't want to bog you down in uh, Cold War history, but I will ask just one question on this period. And uh, it's a question that indeed has been asked many times in regards to the Cold War as a whole. But when we talk about the space domain specifically, was there in the 
early Cold War period, shall we say the 50s or 60s, perhaps even the early 70s, ever an opportunity or a desire to um, make space in some ways a protected domain from the rest of this contest, or at the very least um, implement some facet of uh, superpower cooperation in the space domain? Or was it rather this inexorable trend towards militarization from the get-go? So much of it depends on how you define those those various terms you used, really. So if if you if you're asking about were there efforts to try and have a cordon sanitaire between terrestrial politics and military capabilities and, and dangers and keep that quarantined from space, then no. Um what was going on in space was um for many a you know especially the experts and governments involved and it's sort of a natural extension of that it became too useful to ignore and to cordon off if you're asking well did they want to cooperate well yeah they did you know the superpowers did cooperate in various ways in the cold war and one of my least favorite questions in international relations that i still see being posed by people is um will we see conflict or cooperation between China and America or something like that? It's like, well, a lot of it happens all at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive things because all countries cooperate with each other on some things and compete or go into conflict about others. And space is no different. So in the 1950s, yeah, you didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, coordination or exchange or dialogue or anything between the two superpowers. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis changed a lot of that. Um, Khrushchev and Kennedy, you know, looked into the nuclear abyss and decided, yeah, we really ought to try and coexist. And the United States did start treating the Soviet Union uh, more of as an equal rather than as an upstart revisionist power after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this translated into space activities as well. So, you know, as well as the bad things about human politics going to space, when good politics comes along, that also manifests in space as well. So the Limited Test Ban Treaty of 1963 is part of that. It's it's one of the first tangible uh, outcomes of the early detente between the two superpowers. It just manifests in outer space because to, getting an agreement on space is not easy um, because it's complicated and sensitive. It's It's the outcome of positive political trends that were already in motion, not necessarily the cause of it. And um, so... Though that cooperation in the 1960s, which then also led to the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, and I'm also amazed as to how many um, academics um, and also people in the space industry still don't seem to know that the Outer Space Treaty exists, which is rather astonishing because it's the one of the most popular treaties in the United Nations system and is foundational to everything that happens in space. Um, that was agreed in 1967, and I would argue was one of the high points of detente alongside, uh, you know, SALT and the other big arms control agreements of that detente period, like, you know, the ABM treaty and things like that. Um, but at the same time, the two countries still had hundreds, if not thousands, of nuclear weapons pointed at each other. Um, the Soviets were still supplying arms and other support to um, the Vietnamese, uh, you know, to, to North Vietnam and the Viet Cong against US forces. Um, you were still in a Cold War, but it just wasn't as bad as, you know, the, the early 1960s and late 50s. Um, you know, and in space, you still had the Soviet Union pursue anti-satellite uh, weapons um, and orbital bombardment systems in the 1960s as well. So the Soviet Union tested the FOBs, system in the 1960s. Um, so the fractional orbital bombardment system, effectively uh, vehicles that would go into an orbital flight path and then before completing an orbit, come back down through the atmosphere and then drop a nuclear bomb on the target. Um, a different kind of flight path to a, a regular missile that went the long way around the planet. Um, and this is one of the systems that the Chinese allegedly tested uh, a couple of years ago, which some people foolishly said defied the laws of physics. Well, no, no, this is 1960 stuff. Um, 
anyway, that happened in the context of all this as well. So, so where common ground can be found, if the political conditions are right, they will do it. But it doesn't mean that they're going to drop all hostilities or not agree on everything either. So, so it's it's just it's just complicated, like any other facet of of human activity. And I want to draw on one of the definitely most interesting chapters in this book, which is uh, what you title Beyond Bipolarity, and certainly escaping the constraints of, of the Cold War narrative to begin, and then uh, more contemporary narratives of great power politics today. But you, you've mentioned some of these various space actors that uh, began developing programs in the 60s and 70s, China, India, Japan, France, etc., did these begin broadly as national prestige projects, or did these actors recognize even then the importance that the space domain had towards these practical military and intelligence applications? It's a good question. Um, big question as well. Um, the As with all big technology programs, um, as with all big technology programs, they were a confluence of interests, really. Um and you have different communities, different constituencies wanting these for different reasons. So, yeah, prestige was a part of it. And early on, um, uh, I think it's in the book where um, I believe it was um, some British um, decision makers or senior civil servants talking about how alongside nuclear weapons, um, space technology and rockets, you know, an orbital satellite launch capability was one of the new big um, signifiers of prestige and power in the front rank countries of the world. And without nuclear weapons and space technologies, you know, if you didn't have them, you were now the colonized rather than the colonizers. Um, and, um, you know, that, you know, very, you know, that imperial col- colonial language sort of sums up quite a lot of views about how these technologies were viewed, especially maybe in the 1950s. Um, but Britain and France by the 1960s started diverging uh, in their value. So France carried on with their rocket program and led a lot of the European efforts, West European efforts, because they wanted to have you know strategic essential technologies like nuclear weapons and delivery systems because they just didn't want to rely on the Americans for it. And the Americans weren't as forthcoming with providing any access to advanced systems. The British, meanwhile, could get what they wanted from the Americans. Um, so there was much less of a of a need to have an independent access to space and independent nuclear missiles uh, for the British, whereas France obviously had a different uh, view and experience. So yeah, that divergence there. So you know there were practical reasons behind it as well. And European countries, Jap- Japan and India, they were also aware that. The American economy was so dominant, you know, 1945 to 1965, and the American technology was simply years ahead of so many other countries, that if your economies were going to compete in that capitalist system with the Americans and maintain forms of national industries and national economies, rather than just become dependent on the Americans, you had to invest on in space technologies. You had to modernize. You had to try and keep up and do things. You couldn't do exactly what the Americans are doing, but you had to modernize to keep up and keep your economies competitive. Um, so that was a big drive in Japan and India in particular, but also in, in Europe uh, as well. Um, China was maybe a bit more like the Soviet Union and the early United States, where the military benefits of a nuclear deterrent um, and sort of some essential reconnaissance capability and communications capability in space was a powerful driver. But as uh, after Mao, the um, Chinese space program focused more to civilian development um, as opposed to sort of a nuclear weapons focus. And as we kind of take a look at the contemporary setting, you you mentioned the bipolarity aspect uh, during the Cold War and the the more multipolar aspect now. I think it's fair to say that just like uh, astropolitical scholars, we've seen also a proliferation of of astro politics actors and whether they be commercial entities or um, nations more becoming involved in space. So I want to ask you, as we see this expansion of of players in this domain, what is that going to mean perhaps for this trend of uh, 
the militarization of space for for lack of a better term for now will the presence of of more commercial entities and more states perhaps arrest some of this uh, march towards making space an extension of terrestrial warfare or terrestrial politics or are we just going to see these problems grow worse as more become involved um i don't think it'll change anything or at worst it'll actually only exacerbate the problems really um i i I mean i disagree with some people who say that oh if everyone has more economic interests in space then people will be more reluctant to make a mess up there well, actually, no, because there's always people who lose out. <laughs> there's always people who are disadvantaged by the current economic system. There are always people who will not care about the economic consequences of doing something if the political interests in doing something outweigh the economic costs. So, um, you know, and economic disputes can cause all sorts of other problems as well, which can escalate. So, um you know, it's it, it, you can't be determinant one way or the other about it because so much depends on what we choose to do collectively, um, and whether you know the next fifty years of space governance will be a more equitable system or not. So, are we still going to have effectively a first come first serve system in the international telecommunications union, where? If you want to have the right spectrum slot for your satellite radio communications, um, you've basically got to file for it first than anyone else, and you have like seven years to build and launch your satellite and put it there, or the, uh, it goes up to you know auction again, um, and you know that advantages the um, you know the rich developed developed states more than sort of less developed or emerging space interests. So. Um, so there's all sorts of problems, and I don't see the economic, um, you know, or more private sector uh, entities really changing that. To be honest, um, especially in terms of the military side, the military stuff is going to carry on regardless of if there's more of a private space economy or not. And there's a lot of talk about a private uh, private interest in space right now. The reality is that the bulk of space companies, or what you can call a private space sector, they are chasing government contracts more often than not. So if public spending takes a dip for whatever reason in enough countries, you haven't got anything for those private space companies to do anymore because <laughs> space is still really expensive to do. It's not really something that's open to um, you know, amateurs. It's still something that very well-financed companies can do and very, very few other people, very few other companies can do. So... Um, and, and those companies also registered in their states and they are ultimately beholden to what their states permit them to do or not. Um, and, you know, we've had lots of discussions about Starlink and Ukraine. And, you know, if um, Starlink causes more problems for the US government than it solves, then it risks incurring penalties or it risks never having US government contracts again uh, because it's too much of a problem. And, they, you know, looking at other companies in the United States, so, um, you know, Microsoft and, you know, Jeff Bezos's company and all that, they want to sort of get in on that action. Um, they'll have their own comp- competing systems at some point. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not the sea change people think it is because it's still public spending that drives much of space activity, including commercial space revenues as well. Uh, there's very little in space that is purely to do with um you know private finance and private revenue and private value chains uh, really and um when you have more economic disputes then you just have more problems to solve and the more economic activities that go on in earth orbit the more points of friction there are unless you have a better governing system so yeah i'm not particularly optimistic about that and i'm afraid that's a spin a lot of industrialists are just putting out there Fascinating. And the, the last question I'll ask you on that is uh, perhaps we can search for, for some optimism somewhere. But what might be a um, solution towards, at the very least, uh, in a broader education on this? Is it simply just, as you said, more scholars becoming interested in this work? and Or is there this concern that we are going to leave these developments still to essentially the scientific and military elite of various states. 
I, I recall um, Eisenhower's farewell address. Most of us know the, the famous warning about the military industrial complex. Few of us know that that was followed by a warning of the role that the scientific technical elite might play if unchecked or unmoored from broader political and public interest discussions. So how do we have those broader public interest discussions when it ha- comes to the space domain? Um, well, I, I think people who know and understand these things just have to have to put stuff out there in, in the public domain, really. And you know, I, I do think that um, you know academics do have some responsibility to um, try and publish their things in accessible formats and uh, um, try to have wider, uh, you know, public communications and you know communicate with media as opportunities arise and. Um, you know, and, and try to make people more familiar with, you know, the, the value of having, you know, independent experts on subjects that aren't beholden to government funding or industrial funding, which naturally, um, you know, influences uh, the pathways of research and commentary and, and analysis. So, um, I, and I think um, in terms of education within the academy, it has to come organically by just people wanting to study these things and uh, having more stuff to read about anything is always a good thing. So, you know, hopefully the book makes a, makes a contribution there. Um, and um, I think in terms of public discourse, there's a lot of ground that needs to be covered quite quickly. And it very much depends on, on, on the countries as well in terms of whether they have the balance right between generalists and experts. Um, so different countries have different ways of organising the various space policies and programmes that they have, um, you know, in terms of multi-agency uh, coordination and what are the makeups of those agencies. Because in some countries, you have people without a scientific background leading scientific agencies. Because to be a manager or a strategic leader, you don't have to have you know an in you know an in depth technical expertise. You can understand the the basics or the the so what of what they're doing, uh, whether it's marine science or um, studying lunar regolith. Like if you can get, what is this research trying to find out? Because um, the rest of your stuff is about allocating money, allocating people, managing people, communicating the interests of your organization to people above you, etc. So. So that's very much a country by country thing, and every country has to be wary that um, if you are trying to govern an entire domain, space science and engineering is just one thing that happens there. So in the same way that if you want to have, um, uh, say now in the discussions on the UN clauses on the laws of the sea, or the UN conference on the laws of the sea, UN clause, in those discussions, it wasn't dominated by um, marine scientists, or if it wasn't dominated by ship engineers, it was massive effort with cross government and cross expertise uh, approaches. People, you know, scientists and engineers are of course in there, but legal experts, politics experts, ecology experts, um, you know, economics people. Um, civil society of many different walks as well. In the same way, if you're trying to have a massive new treaty for space, you couldn't have just planetary scientists there because they won't know the politics of the law of what's going on. They won't necessarily um, understand much about maybe the the ethical quandaries that may arise or how to negotiate disputes and things like that. So, um, So it's about understanding the roles of different expertise in a place like space, because space is a place. It's not just one single policy issue, uh, really. Well, for those who do want to understand better the role that this space domain plays in, in our lives and the topics that we've broadly spoke about, this book is a great place to start. The author is Blethyn Bowen. The book is Original Sin. And Blethyn, thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. For New Books Network, this is Sam Cantor. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.